Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hi, so it's great to be with you all today. I have to admit, uh, we'll just get it out there at the beginning since, since Glenn was outed, um, I also had an early affiliation with a, a school up the river. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize that what was wonderful about coming to MIT and then remaining here for the rest of my career is that economics, like so much uh, of the rest of MIT, really celebrates marrying the theory and modeling with um, what's going on in the world, and as Glenn said, trying to make both those connections and to influence that. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the way economics speaks to antitrust, to competition policy, which is a topic that, you know, 10 years ago might have been a little more esoteric if I were talking to this group, um, but I think in the last few years um, has gotten enough attention in the front, front pages of the newspapers um, and, uh, and NPR and other places you might have listened to um, so that uh, many of these topics are, are of tremendous current interest. So there's a lot of ongoing debate over what's called concentration, the, the, um, the rise of large firms and the concentration of economic activity within those large firms, what that may or may not imply about competition and what we should do about it. Um, that's particularly true in the tech sector, where there's been an enormous amount of rhetoric um, about big tech, um, lawsuits that have been filed by the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, by state's attorney generals, by, um, by private actors, uh, calls for regulation in Europe and the UK. There's been much more um, activity on the regulation front with legislation to regulate big tech. Um, all of it concerned ab about, or much of it concerned about the market power of those firms, whether it was fairly acquired and what it implies for competition going forward. Um, in the context of that debate, I think one of the central questions that has emerged is whether the antitrust framework is broken. So there's a progressive voice, set of voices out there now um, that, that basically take the theme that antitrust should be about um, anti-big, that large firms damage our democracy, that there's been too much consolidation of both economic and political power, and that competition policy, antitrust in the US has focused too much on economic and competition harms and not enough about these kind of residual, uh, or, um, uh, not residual, but these other concerns about political power, about harm to, to workers or small businesses, about income redistribution and so forth. And those voices want to reduce or even eliminate the role for economics and competition policy. There's a centrist group, and I'd, I'd identify myself as part of that, that says antitrust should focus on competition and economics can help. Um, and that while we may not have been as effective in antitrust enforcement as we need to be, there are things that we can do to, to help um, uh, restore the balance. And then the, the group on kind of the other side is often called the Chicago School, um, typically associated with Robert Bork, and that school argues that markets tend inexorably toward competition, that firm conduct is generally efficient, that antitrust enforcement is therefore likely to cause more problems than it corrects, and that we need to worry more about blocking actions that have economic benefits um, than we do about the harms of, of failing to block um, anti-competitive conduct. So that's kind of the framework for the debate. And I want to spend a, a few minutes just talking about some of the evidence that gets pointed to for this. Because I think here we're falling short. And you know, as Glenn said, um, uh, many of us in the economics department are um, I've sometimes been called relentlessly empirical. We want to go to the data. But we also want to understand what the data are trying to tell us. So if we ask what the evidence is for um, the failure of antitrust to prevent um, uh, reductions in competition, many people point to graphs like this. You can't see the, the, um, the axes. It doesn't matter. I'll just tell you the vertical axis is a measure of concentration. It's how much, what the, the share of the four largest firms in a particular industry, um, uh, what revenue share they have. Um, the bottom lines are, um, are uh, um, measures of that for, for 20 firms. And what you see, and across the, the um, x-axis is time. So what you see is that, on average, across these 
kind of aggregate industries, um, that concentration appears to be rising. And that's been pointed to as evidence of a problem. But despite the increases in average concentration, these are typically analyses that are done at such aggregate industry levels that, first of all, they just don't tell us very much about, is it something to worry about? And so, for example, um, the industry with the high, or the, the sector with the highest average concentration, um, which is manufacturing, has gone from 39% share of the four largest firms to 44% share. What that means is that there, if, if these were really markets, if these represented um, uh, choices that consumers were making com among these competing firms, the customers would have at least 11 firms to choose from which is a pretty competitive um, market if you think about it. If you had you know, 11 um, internet providers to choose from, you'd think you were you know, living high with a lot of choice. Um, and in other markets, you know, the level of concentration is even lower. So you'd have you know, 15 or, or um, uh, in some cases even more firms to choose from. So, so I think it's a little misleading to say that there's a, a trend that's been uh, toward higher concentration and we should be alarmed by that if these were really representing um, markets that consumers were choosing from. Um, moreover, if we dig a little bit deeper into these statistics, we find that more local markets show declines in concentration of economic activity, not increases. So this is a graph from a paper uh, by um, a group of economists at Princeton, and the top solid lines are showing kind of movement changes in national concentration measures, and the bottom dotted lines are showing changes across different sectors um, in, in zip code level concentration. And that's suggesting that consumers may have more choice at the local level um, than the national statistics would indicate. And this carries through even to more better defined product markets. So here's a, a set of work that was done by um, a set of economists at Stanford, um, and they're looking at consumer products where we can look at the brands that consumers buy and map those to be um, uh, well-defined markets where consumers are choosing between Coke and Pepsi and, and maybe a store brand of cola. Um, and what their evidence shows is that while the concentration of revenue for consumer products is pretty high throughout the period, if anything for these well-defined markets, the trend seems to be, to, again, toward concentration falling. So in this example, you know, a market might be cars, or a market might be trucks, or a market might be motorcycles. And then in the bottom, you're seeing that sector concentration levels have gone up somewhat over time. Sectors, in this case, think of you know, automobile products, where it's combining all of those different um, product categories. Um, so that's kind of one set of, of facts that have been um, uh, argued to push for changes in antitrust policy. As you can tell, I'm a little bit skeptical of what, what the takeaway should be from those, and I think you should be as well. More recently, I think we've gone out on an even further limb, which is to blame antitrust for price increases, for inflation, and for shortages. Um, so the Biden administration has called for antitrust enforcement to combat inflation. The Federal Trade Commission Chair, Lena Kahn, has blamed the baby formula shortage on antitrust failures, um, and the White House has had a kind of uh, many months long uh, campaign to attribute rising meat prices to concentration in the meatpacking industry. The problem with these arguments, I think, is that even if we think that firms have gained more market power, say, by acquiring competitors through mergers, um, that hasn't changed very much over the last six months, 12 months, um, in the case of meatpacking, you know, even several years. And so it's a little hard to say how do we map the, how do we, how do we attribute the cause of, say, an increase in meat prices today on concentration increases that might have happened, you know, five or ten years ago. Um, and similarly, with respect to the baby formula um, shortage, you know, I don't think we have all of the facts on that. Um, there are, I think, um, multiple causes for, uh, for why we might be where we are. Um, but the, but the frequently cited statistic of this is, a, this is a problem because there are only three or four companies that produce virtually all of the baby formula in the US, I think misses the point that even if we had 20 firms producing baby formula in the US, if you have one plant that is producing 20% of the baby formula and you shut that plant down, you're going to have 
shortages and price increases um, as a result of that, independent of the ownership concentration. Um, so I, again, I think that, that these are perhaps arguments that play into the political narrative, but, but maybe are not so satisfying for those of us who want more rigorous um, uh, analyses. Now, that said, while I think that debates over aggregate concentration trends or inflation um, may be you know, an appealing narrative but ultimately a red herring, I believe that the evidence on antitrust enforcement suggests that there is a cause for concern and a need for further action independently of resolving this, this concentration trend debate. And here's some of the evidence that I would point to. First, we see that merger activity has been high and rising since the mid-1990s, with now in, in you know, the typical year, um, 15,000 or more, more mergers taking place, um, or mergers and acquisitions of firms taking place. So think 15,000 mergers, very few of them are investigated by the Department of Justice or the FTC, which share antitrust enforcement responsibility in the US. So here's a, a chart of merger investigations um, from 1996 to 2019. Um, the, to the dark blue um, uh, line represents investigations that are opened um, and, and pursued. Um, they're capping out at sort of 60 in a typical year, right? So the agencies have about 2,000 mergers reported to them. They're opening investigations and doing deep dives into them for about 60. and in, roughly half of those, maybe a little bit more than half, um, sometimes two-thirds, um, they're taking action to challenge those mergers. So that's a number like 30 or 35. So 2,000 mergers, you know, 15,000 mergers happening, 2,000 reported to the agencies because they're large enough to pass reporting thresholds, and 35 being challenged. Now that could be because we're so good at antitrust enforcement that anti-competitive mergers are never proposed, and so you don't have to challenge any. Um, but I can tell you from my 28 months at, at DOJ that I don't believe that's what's going on. Um, this problem is particularly acute for smaller transactions, which you know, may not involve a lot of dollars, but can involve um, quite substantial increases in market power in kind of more narrow product markets. So think about um, two hospitals that might be, mer two rural hospitals that might be merging, maybe below the reporting threshold, um, and uh, as the bottom dotted lines are showing us here in work that was done by, by Tom Woolman at Chicago, um, once the, the laws were changed to increase the reporting threshold for mergers, the agencies basically stopped investigating um, or challenging those smaller mergers. Um, uh, if we look at anti-competitive conduct, so monopolization cases like the Facebook case, the Google cases that have been filed, um, those actions are even more rare than merger enforcement actions. Um, so, you know, particularly for the DOJ, which has had, you know, at most um, a couple of, of monopolization cases in the typical year. Um, the FTC does a few more, but, you know, since the, the uh, mid-2000s, we've never had more than 10 monopolization cases um, filed by either agency. This is across the entire American economy, so anti any type of, of anti-competitive um, uh, conduct other than cartels. Um, so the question you might ask yourself is, you know, why is antitrust enforcement doing such a terrible job? Um, I think the first and foremost cause is likely to be that we have starved the enforcement agencies. So state attorneys general have standing to sue both under federal and state antitrust laws, but almost none of them even have antitrust experts on staff because those those organizations just are, are too small to scale for that. So the federal antitrust agencies are really the ones who are going to be primarily responsible, um, and they have faced as that solid line that looks roughly flat to you, maybe a little bit of an increase indicates, they've basically faced flat budgets in real terms, um, and that's against a dramatic increase in the um, number of mergers that we've seen and in the size of the economy, and in the cost of enforcement. So in the salaries that you have to pay to hire attorneys and economists to help you investigate and litigate um, anti-competitive behavior. Um, and so not only has the budget been flat, um, but, um, but the example of this in terms of personnel is the Federal Trade Commission is down by roughly 700 people in headcount since 1979, 
again, against an economy that is substantially larger. Um, so if you don't have the people to investigate behavior and to litigate behavior, um, you're not gonna see the challenges. Um, moreover, the agencies are facing a judiciary that is increasingly skeptical of antitrust enforcement. Um, so enforcement agencies, or in the US even private individuals, can, can challenge anti-competitive conduct, but they don't get to say, this merger is anti-competitive, so you can't merge. Blocking mergers or, or anti-competitive exclusionary conduct requires convincing a judge, and then ultimately, and if it's important to the companies, an appellate court or even the Supreme Court, to agree with the agency's determination. Um, and judges have been heavily inculcated in the Chicago School ideology that I mentioned before, that is this, you know, markets are inexorably um, tending toward competition. And they have, over the last 40 years, systematically increased the burdens on plaintiffs. So it's much more difficult now um, to successfully challenge, particularly conduct. Um, mergers, as I said, the government still brings um, merger challenges, and it's generally, not always, but generally successful um, in most of those challenges. Um, but for conduct and for more innovative theories of harm, like potential competition, so if you've read about the Facebook complaint, you know, one of the things, one of the monopolization claims in the Facebook case is that Facebook acquired Instagram and WhatsApp in an effort to avoid those firms from becoming competitors to Facebook. Um, the FTC investigated but did not challenge those mergers when they were proposed, and I think part of the reason is the case law for that type of challenge is terrible for the agencies, and they probably didn't think they had a chance of winning it, even if they were convinced it was problematic. The good news is that economic research, I think, can provide the foundation for positive changes in, in enforcement and policy, and in fact, it already is doing exactly that. So recent work, just restricting myself to the last few years, there's been work on enforcement resources that I think has heavily influenced the, the congr apparent congressional willingness to increase agency budgets. Not as much as is needed, but, but by a significant amount. There have been merger retrospectives in product markets that have illustrated the problems of certain types of mergers and, um, and illustrated the, the um, problem of anti-competitive mergers in terms of adverse price, quality, product assortment, and other effects. Um, there's a, a new strand of research that's looking at the impact of mergers on labor markets and workers, the growth of wages um, and, uh, and employment, and I, that's introduced this um, into the debate, and the agencies are now looking at labor market, potential labor market harms in their investigations. I mentioned potential competition. That's had a lot of interesting work recently that's getting attention. Stealth acquisitions, those were those small acquisitions that skate under the radar. Um, and vertical mergers all have had important contributions. I've just given you a few of the economics papers that have influenced these, there are myriad others. Um, in general, there's a very robust interface between enforcement, industry, and economic research. And what I'm just giving you here, I'm not expecting you to read the slide, but the boxes are mergers. Most of them are mergers I worked on when I was at DOJ. The little bubbles are economics papers that were influential either in helping the agencies to understand how the merger affected competition in that, in that industry, in those markets, um, or in some cases that looked after the fact to evaluate the quality of agency decision making before and then influenced how the agency would, would um, interact with the next proposal. Um, so I think there's a very rich dialogue that's going on, um, but there's lots more work to be done that's part of my research agenda and that of, of um, dozens and dozens of economists. And at this point, I think I'll, I'll stop and maybe take questions. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, so, uh, just I'm getting questions coming out on the iPad, and it's yep. a little quick for me to read them, but I just uh, <laughs> want to read some of the audience questions. So, um, you know, 
one question is, should antitrust be focused on consumer protection, as in the classic US model, or focused on protecting competitors, as in the European model? And I don't know if you would agree that's the European model, but. Um. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, I did not talk about what's often called the consumer welfare standard. That's a kind of uh, um, antitrust insider term that's got a tremendous amount of debate associated with it. So the first thing to recognize is that while we talk about the US as having this consumer welfare standard, which makes it sound like we just care about consumers and, and also makes us think we only look downstream, um, in fact, the way that's implemented in US antitrust policy is um, protecting um, uh, the competitive process. It's a way of articulating what it means to protect the competitive process. And it basically says, does this merger or does this conduct disadvantage trading partners, um, or in the case of, of um, some types of mergers, it might be reduced competition among um, rivals to me, but in a way that, that creates adverse outcomes. I think Europe is not tremendously different from us in most respects, um, though the fact that the European Commission, which is responsible for enforcing EU-wide competition law, um, also has a prohibition on, uh, also has its role as um, keeping a level playing field, means that it sometimes is more engaged in protecting competitors. Um, and I think in the US we think, you know, if competition is served by me out-competing Glenn, that's, that's okay as long as I'm not doing anything um, anti-competitive, I'm not creating exclusive contracts or preventing people from interacting with Glenn. So I, I would say I'm pretty ha satisfied with the way we implement or the way we think about our law. I'm less satisfied with the way that judges are creating burdens on plaintiffs. So I, I guess following up on that, I have a question about, um, you mentioned that sort of judges have gotten inculcated in the Chicago school yeah. reasoning and can you, any insights on how that happened? And actually also, I guess, with another question, you know, the contrast between people asking, you know, it seems that younger people are even more on the opposite side and feeling, uh, you know, having views heading towards, you know, on the socialist side of Econ 101. And how do you get the sort of anti-power views in some generations and the Chicago skew views in others? Yeah, so the, I think the first part of the question is pretty easy. I was, I was surprised to, to um, to get some insight into digging under the hood on this. So, um, so there are a number of organizations um, that are um, promoting um, what I'll call pro-business, though I honestly think if you believe in, in the market and you believe in business, you want a level playing field. So I don't think it's pro-business to, um, to be against antitrust, but um, but there are a number of organizations. The Federal Society is one of them. It's maybe well known for its views on kind of social issues in the judiciary, but it's also very active in terms of economic issues. They fund very lavish um, education conferences in very attractive resorts and other places where judges can come with, I think with their families, although I don't know what the tax implications of that is, but they can come spend some time in these lovely places and learn about economics and antitrust. Because most judges are generalists. They, don't, they probably didn't have any economics when they were in college or in law school. They don't know about antitrust. Um, and the curriculum of those courses, I've, I've taken a look at, um, at a couple of them, um, is very tilted toward the Chicago school. In fact, it reads like an economic syllabus from the 1970s. And you know, as Glenn has suggested, we like to think that we've learned a lot about economics um, uh, since the 1970s. Um, but but the judges in, in these courses are not learning anything about that. And I think that's part of how that's getting transmitted um, to the judiciary. There are courses that are more balanced, but they tend to be taught in college classrooms, um, and you know, are, are low budget. And I just think they're not they're not attracting as many judges to them. Okay, uh, I have a question about how do you think about uh, efficiencies that conglomerates bring by integrating competitors into one system? So the example given in the question is WeChat and Tencent in China. Um, but do you feel that, or if Facebook takes operation of Instagram, you know, are, do, are there 
how do we think about efficiencies of combining things together within a firm versus the potentially anti-competitive harms? I, I think that's the kind of $64 billion question in many of these mergers is, you know, you, you hear right now um, Chairman Khan and uh, Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor talk about um, trying to prevent companies from, uh, particularly the tech companies, from building moats around their enterprise. And the concern is that they're acquiring, you know, take, take the allegations in the Facebook um, uh, monopolization case. They're acquiring companies like Instagram, not because there are efficiencies, but because Instagram represented a threat. There are a lot of young users that were spending a lot of time on Instagram and that that was taking kind of eyeballs and time away from Facebook or threatened to do that in the future. Um, and so I think while the agencies in any of these cases do very deep dives trying to understand the particular facts and circumstances, you know, that's one of the challenges they have is how much is this something where you're creating new product opportunities and that's benefiting everyone by allowing the merger to go through versus how much are you just solidifying um, or enhancing market power. Um, and the other thing I think that you have to ask yourself is, you know, even if the former is true and there are these efficiencies from combining different kinds of companies, do you have to do that by acquisition or can you do that by organic growth? Um, and for some of these big companies, you might think they've got the resources to do it organically and then you'd have two competitors instead of one. Okay, and um, question, you know, are you willing to share your views on um, a European Union attempt to require companies like Apple and Google to open up their app stores to comp competing payment systems? Do you have views on sort of what are the main economic reasons, arguments for and against, and balance of uh, which may be more important? So do, uh, just very briefly, I, I think those are complex questions. You know, one of the, one of the things about competition policy is that things that you, activities that you engage in when you're a small piece of the market um, that might be fine because you don't have a lot of market power um, and you don't have the power to exclude rivals. Um, if you get to a position where you're the dominant player, um, that same type of activity might be much more problematic. So something that, um, you know, firms often sign exclusive deals with, um, uh, with other firms. And if you're small and starting out, that might be something that no one would ever worry about. It might be a way of you kind of beginning to grow and leverage up. But if you're a dominant firm in a market and you sign those same types of exclusive deals, um, then you may be able to preclude anybody else from coming in and competing with you. So I think the App Store debate that's going on is, is you know, basically recognizing that now Google Play and, and Apple are in very different positions than they might have been before, especially as activity has moved increasingly to mobile devices and, and your desktop computer may be sitting unused most of the time. Um, I, I don't know that I've got an answer, but I think it's certainly legitimate to be looking at that and thinking about um, whether there need to be more restrictions on what they can do. Okay, and, and I guess uh, I think we have time for one final question. I wanted to ask, um, you know, to what degree do you see the US and EU antitrust policies is being driven by political pressures? And is that something that we you know, should avoid or what, what could we do practically to get more of an economic influence on antitrust policy than political influence? Yeah, so I, again, this is something I'd probably answer differently now than I would have answered in 2017 when I just left DOJ. When I was at DOJ, I think, it wasn't just my experience while I was there, but everyone, the career people in the agency, really thought of the agency mission as law enforcement, and um, there was a tremendous amount of effort made to make sure that we were insulated from any kind of political pressure. So not just the fact of it, but even the appearance of it. Um, I think in, in the last administration, um, particularly at DOJ, it was clear that there was a lot of politics in, in decision making that was, went on. There were whistleblowers that alleged that and appeared before Congress to talk about it. Um, I, I think now it seems like that border is also kind of frayed a bit. Um, in the EU, there's a little bit of that, I think, that's alleged sometimes with respect to national champions. I do think the career staff, um, both in the European Commission and in the agencies in the US, 
um, do their best to call it on the merits and to undertake investigations on the merits and, and to resist political um, influence into decision making. Um, but the heads of all of those agencies um, are political appointments. Um, and so I think, you know, if, if we want to ensure the continuation of the rule of law and an objective set of arbiters um, for competition policy, we all should be trying to resist those types of political pressures. Okay. Uh, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.